This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is George Mumford. He is a world-renowned psychologist and mindfulness performance expert or coach. And he has coached some really interesting students, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, to name a few. George's story is one of up and down and chaos like all of our lives. It's not a straight line. Lots of down moments and lots of up moments. But all of those moments make George who he is today. And put it this way, if you want to be unlocked, which is his term and the title of his new book, this is the type of conversation that I promise you will have a nugget somewhere that will resonate with you and probably motivate you. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation today with George Mumford. I hope you enjoy. You're a guy that's good enough to play college basketball. You get to the University of Massachusetts, right? Yeah. You're good enough. You happen to have injuries, and you can speak to that, but some injuries can't go as far as you'd like. But you do have a quite interesting roommate at UMass. Exactly right. Dr. J, Julius Irving. That's just kind of an initial meeting for you or interesting person in your life at high levels of basketball. Speak to that experience. Is there anything you, you took away from that early experience and meeting someone like that in his formative stages too? Was there something that you took away from those early meetings with him? Well, first of all, he was just an incredible person. As great as he was as a basketball player in his heyday, he was a much better person. And that's not diminishing his athletic skills and his basketball skill because he was really, really good at that point. But he was just an amazing person. The fascinating thing is when I first met him, a friend of mine was going to school down south, I think it was Winston-Salem or one of those schools, and they talked about hearing this guy, Julius Irving, watching him play and heard he was a really good player. I had heard about him, but then when I got to UMass and it was the freshman orientation, I did the last freshman orientation, which was Labor Day weekend. So I did my orientation that Friday and Saturday. So I was on campus. I went by one of these outdoor courts and he was out there playing basketball and he was playing in street shoes. He didn't even have on sneakers and he was dunking on people. And I was saying to myself, who's this dude, man? Who this dude is? You know, that's amazing. I've never seen anything <laughs> like that. And that was my first introduction to him was when he was playing pickup. And then obviously I ended up playing pickup and that's how we got to be roommates my sophomore year because we had a mutual friend we used to play pickup with there was a head of residence and he wanted us on the same floor. So that's how I got to be roommates. And of course, when he wasn't playing for the team, I was, we were playing pickup or sometimes we would go around to Hartford and other places to play. And I was part of that group. So I roomed with him, I played against him, played with him back in the early days. Now, if I had to jump forward in your career, so we get to the 90s and you have gone down the path of understanding mindfulness And you get introduced to Phil Jackson and the Bulls. Now, from that moment where you had a chance to get to know someone like Dr. J, you can't progress in basketball because of injuries. But between those, that gap, what was going on in that gap? Because you didn't really stay associated with basketball, did you necessarily? Yes, I did continue to play, but not like that. What happened was my sophomore year, when I was rooming with Julius, I got injured. And that's when I no longer pursued college basketball or any formal basketball at that level. And so I got addicted to pain meds and I started doing illegal drugs. So then I started leading a double life. Like I was with Julius and Al Skinner was another one of the folks. He was my roommate after Julius went hardship, you know, left. For the youngsters that don't know, hardship meaning he just went to the NBA. Yes. Thank you. So back in those days, you still were required to go to college before you played in the NBA, but they had what they call a hardship rule. 
that you could declare hardship and leave college early. So Julius left college after his junior year, and he signed with Virginia Squires, and he became a professional basketball player. So while he was around, and then that was my junior year, and then my senior year, I roomed with Al Skinner, who went on to play in the NBA and the coach Boston College and Rhode Island and do other things. So I lost my way, but I was a functional substance abuser. And then I graduated from college and got a job. And I continued to be a functioning substance abuser. So I graduated in 73. And I was able to continue to work and engage until I ended up getting addicted, obviously. And in 19, so that's 73. So I worked 73. And I was still working in 1984 when I got into recovery. Then I went into recovery July of 1984. I'm coming up on 30 years. Or was it 39 years? I'm sorry. Of sobriety. I got into meditation and mindfulness and the whole mind-body process because I realized I had chronic pain. I had migraine headaches and I had a back issue even when I was rooming with Dr. J in 1970. I had a board underneath my bed because I had back issues going back to 1969, 70. When I got into recovery, I had to deal with the chronic pain. So I got into this experimental program that was being given through the HMO I was in, which was the Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates. I forget what they call them back then. I got introduced to Joan Borisenko and she introduced me to the mind-body medicine. That's how I got into meditation and yoga. The real emphasis was on self-care. In other words, taking responsibility for my health care and not just going to a doctor and signing up and having the doctor tell me what to do. But I changed my lifestyle so that my lifestyle was conducive to managing my pain, dealing with chronic pain. And that led me to meditation and self-discovery. I started reading because part of the program was educational and you did pre and post testing. That's when I started my book a week phase back in 84. So I've been reading over a book a week and doing all sorts of other things to help with my development. That's how I got into it. I have a feeling where you're going to pivot to, but I wanted to ask a question about that period of time. And if I'm thinking about the dates that you told me, it sounded about like 10 years of being maybe, as you say, kind of a closet addict that people didn't know. Would this have been heroin? Well, I was always active a little bit during the off season. So I would say... Like everybody else, I used to drink and do things in the off season and whatnot. But when I got injured, then I didn't really have a deterrent to regulate. See, that's the thing about substance abuse. You can regulate it for a period of time, but then it comes a time when you can't regulate it and it regulates you or it runs you. I think it started catching up with me in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84. And then once I got in recovery, July of 84, that's when I started learning about the mind-body process and taking personal responsibility for myself and then realizing that I could self-regulate at self-awareness and I could self-regulate. That's self-regulated thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, specifically lifestyle change and realizing that there's a way I could relate to experience in a way that helped me get on the process of learning, growth, and development or what I would call now establishing a growth mindset it was always looking at things, even my recovery and my experience in ways that I needed to learn the lessons and then to share those lessons with others. Here's what I really want to drive in on. So I had a family member that passed, a younger male who passed, I think, from OxyContin. And of course, we've got the fentanyl going across America. Your early experiences, you had experiences with heroin. The most I've ever tried is just weed. I'm curious, though, if you can describe the feeling that these types of opiate type drugs leave one with, because I'm really curious. I've never really asked that question. What is the feeling that causes so many people to reach for assorted opiate derivatives? What is that feeling? When putting alcohol and drugs in that same category, you want to alter your consciousness. You're looking for a spirit. Of course, John Bollycorn and drugs is one way to alter your consciousness. It's not a healthy way, but it's a way to get away from your emotional pain and physical pain and just to really get you away from your painful life or being present. You're somewhere else. You're not really there. You ever experienced a run is high? Of course. Yoga high. That's a natural way of feeling that energy, that high, that exuberation. 
I call it folding space. I mean, you just leave your body and it's just a euphoric feeling. But the challenge is, even if you do have medication, what happens is your dopamine or the dopaminergic system gets hijacked by the illegal drugs. You're getting a synthetic high, which really isn't that efficient and it's not that regulated. That's why you can get ODs because you're not getting like 10 milligrams or whatever. But the main thing is what happens is you get addicted because the more you use, the more you have to use. If you drink 12 ounces of beer now and then you get a buzz, now you got to drink 20 ounces maybe, and you got to keep drinking more and more to get to that level. So I'm using that as drugs. So your body gets adapted to it and then you have to keep getting more and more and more. So you get addicted and you get into this cycle where you keep trying to get a certain high or getting a certain level of consciousness and you're not able to do it or you do it, but you do it at a cost of not being present for your life. And then you develop bad habits. It's been a while, but it's like when I get in a flow or I get a natural high or when I get an endorphin rush because I'm pushing through a new level or I'm learning something and I'm getting that joy of discovery. I think it's the same kind of spirit. I think we have this need to alter consciousness and to get to different levels of consciousness. I think one way that I tried to do that is through illegal drugs and medication. Like I said, it got to the point where it didn't work anymore. I couldn't stop and I couldn't keep doing it. So once I got over that edge, once I detoxed, then I had to figure out how to deal with chronic pain. And I still use pain meds, but it's using them for the pain, not abusing them. Just think about it this way. You like eating a certain food or you like chocolate cake. If I was to eat five hamburgers a day or something like that, whatever. Yeah. Well, your nervous system gets hijacked. Let's just put it that way. And it keeps saying more and more and more. So some of it is physical. I learned that it's, in those days, I used to call it a threefold disease. There's a physical addiction where you cross a line. And if you don't get it, you get sick. Your body gets into a, like you have a virus or you have the flu or something. And your body's not going to get back to equilibrium unless you ingest more of the substance, whatever it is. So you get to a point where you just lose control of it. You have to detox or you have to get off of it. And then once you get off of it physically, then you got the mental and the spiritual dimensions of it and even the emotional dimension of the ism. So for me, even though I haven't used and coming up on 39 years, it doesn't mean I can go back to using and safety. I use abstinence, but that addictive quality is still there. I can never drink in drug and safety. And approaching it one day at a time, way back in the beginning, that was manageable. And so one day becomes two days. And you know now I'm looking at going in my 39th. I mean, it's a great story of overcoming. It had to have been for somebody who had these early basketball experiences. Then you have some hardships, then some substance addiction. You get into recovery. You are exposed to mindfulness. I think you're working with young people, perhaps up in the Boston area, helping them to be exposed to it. Tell me if my phrasing is wrong, but essentially, all of a sudden, you're introduced to Phil Jackson and the Bulls, Michael Jordan, heyday, 1990s. And essentially, the request is, George, can you help our team with mindfulness? Is that essentially what happened? People use the word mindfulness. Back in those days, we didn't call it mindfulness. It was that Zen stuff. That was a catchphrase. Was my setup correct, though, that it was essentially out of the blue? Yeah. Well, they told Dr. J, they said they would interview him and said, what's it feel like to be an overnight success? And you know what his answer was? It's taken me my whole life to become an overnight success. <laughs> Even though it seemed like all of a sudden it's been a progression. I was on this path of learning, growth, and development. Once I dealt with the chronic pain, then I got into not only did it help me with the chronic pain, but it increased my quality of life. And it gave me the stress resilience to be able to overcome adversity and challenges and to meet challenges. And you clearly wanted to give back at that moment in time, too. You've experienced this overcoming and you want to share how you did it with others. How was I able to do what I've been trying to do for the longest time? And what I realized that I, because I got in touch with a higher power or a higher consciousness. So I was still working as a financial analyst during the day. And then I would go to graduate school and get my master's degree. And I was volunteering and working in detoxes. And I lived at a meditation center for a period of time. So I was 
getting requests from people from all walks of life. It could be a business. It could be a youth detention center. It could be a community. It could be working with Harvard Law students or... Could be the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And so what happened was, so I was still working and then I was teaching in prison. So when I quit my job and I was working in prison, and then I started working at the Center for Mindfulness, this is where John Kabat-Zinn comes in. I started working with him and we developed a satellite clinic in the inner city of Worcester on the other side of railroad tracks, not the folks that go to the main clinic. So I worked for the Center for Mindfulness or the University of Massachusetts Medical Center for five years. And in the five years, I was working a set up in a city clinic, and then I was going into prisons. But I was going in and working with inmates before I joined UMass. But then John and I got together and we wrote a grant, and we started working directly with the Department of Corrections, Massachusetts Department of Corrections. And it's while I was there working at the medical center and the stress reduction and relaxation program is what we call it. They call it the Center for Mindfulness now, or after I left, that's what it became. But what happened was I started working full-time just teaching people in the inner city clinic. It was people that had mind-body medicine and understand the mind and body of one and that whole idea of self-care, taking responsibility for yourself. I was working with people that came to the medical center that had symptoms that weren't really addressed through a traditional medicine. So now we bring in consciousness or we bring in mindfulness-based stress reduction. So I was teaching that to inmates as well as in the inner city. In 1993, John Kabat-Zinn used to go to a place called Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. He used to do mindfulness-based stress reduction training for social workers and healthcare professionals at this place, Omega Institute. And at the same time, Phil Jackson used to do a program called Beyond Basketball. One of his New York Nick teammates, Eddie Mask, had died of a heart attack. So this was a way of raising money for the family. So every summer he would go there and teach. And so this one summer, 1993, the Bulls had just won three NBA championships in a row. And he was talking to Phil and his wife, June, John was, and Phil was interested in bringing somebody into the Bulls to help them deal with the stress of success. Because people don't realize that being successful is really stressful because people come at you and you got like a target on your back and you're getting everybody's A game. Phil reached out to John and then they decided that I would be the best person for that gig simply because of my experience with Dr. J in college and just knowing and also being similar to a lot of the players. I came from a similar background that they came from and I would be able to relate to them. Phil and I had talked and then I was invited to the Bulls training camp in 1993, October 1993. Then that's when I got... Can I ask a question? At that moment in time, you're invited to the training camp. Now, perhaps there's an introduction or whatever, or I'm guessing there was a decent amount of observation by you. You lay it out. You say, okay, they've won three championships. I'm coming in to help guide them to dealing with success. Speak to some of those first observations of seeing the team in action and the players, your initial feelings and reactions. Funny thing happened on the way to the forum. You're probably too young to know about that TV series or that saying. Make a long story short, after they won the championship, Michael Jordan's father got murdered and Michael retired. So Phil and I had talked about going to work with me coming there and we had decided that I would come there in October. In the interim, Michael retired. So when I went there, they were in a full-blown crisis. So we went from dealing with the stress of success to dealing with the stress of having your best player not there and your whole team identity and everything is nondescript. They had to really figure out a lot. So when I went there, they were in full-blown crisis. So my job was to go there and obviously observation. So I had complete access. I was obviously in the locker room, in the courts. So part of it was observation and the other part of it was just being introduced to them and bringing the mindfulness-based stress reduction. Well, actually, it was more than that. It was more about, I would call it warrior training. That's how I looked at it. How to talk to them about everybody had experiences of being in flow or the zone. The idea was I was talking to them about what I was offering them would make them zone ready, like mindfulness. I didn't really call it mindfulness. It was more about mental training because I worked in the medical center of mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's like, how do you manage stress, the stress of success as well as just distress? 
So I went in and that was how I was able to approach them. But it was definitely warrior training and how to be able to say yes, to meet things as they are, and to use it as a springboard, as a stepping stone. As you start to help this team that is in a little bit of chaos with their best player leaving, was there universal buy-in or were there some guys that were like, hey, George, whatever? I didn't know enough to know the answer to that. I just knew because I work with people all the time in different environments. Now and I talk about it, I go in and just talk to them about the idea that they have a tremendous potential inside of them and it can be developed, but it can only be developed by them. And to the degree that they develop that potential, that talent or that masterpiece within, their life will be a reflection of that. I phrase it that way because this team had just won three championships already. So there's a certain amount of confidence there already. I knew that if I shared what I knew, which is my experience, that I'm an expert in my experience. And my job was to help share my experience, strength and hope and say, okay, here's a way forward. So my first thing was, and it's very vivid to me, the Chinese have this symbol for crisis. I believe it's Chinese, it's from Asia. It has two meanings. One meaning is danger, the other meaning is opportunity. I mean, I didn't have Vin Diesel language in those days, but I would say, don't get up if you can't keep up or step up or step aside. It's a moment of truth. What do you want to do? Do you want to get down? You want to sit down or you want to get up? My approach was, okay, I see this as a tremendous opportunity for you all to find yourselves to actually level up and see it as an opportunity to bring more energy and to actually raise your game and raise your way of being. But let's be resilient. This is what I'm talking about. Something happens as a crisis, but if you see it more as an opportunity versus being in danger and trying to avoid stuff, but to embrace it and see where it takes you to be on this hero's journey or this amazing adventure, if something happens and then the real question is, how are you going to respond and relate to it or respond to it? People might forget, but that year where Michael Jordan went and played baseball was away from the Bulls. They had a really good year that year with Pippen as the leader. We won 55 games. Yes, really good year. But that was it. To answer your question, it's always about, I think because of Phil and because they had success and because of Phil and his coaches and his philosophy and his vision of always looking to make the team better as whole people, not as individuals, but as a whole person, mind, body, heart, and soul. So he was always bringing something in or doing something differently. And he had done meditation mindfulness or that Zen stuff is how they would refer to him being a Zen master and whatnot. That he wanted to bring somebody in that could teach them and freeze them up to do other things. But also, this is what I do. This is my expertise. I was brought in to actually help them, if you will, unlock. Okay, we do get back to the point in time where Jordan joins the team. Give me first impressions. Give me some feeling for your work with Jordan and how you feel like you did influence his growth. I think a big part of it is, and I would say this about Michael, and I can say the same thing about Kobe, is that they're coachable, they're teachable, they're curious. You just have to, whatever you're offering them, it has to be, they'll trust, but you got to verify it. So my whole approach was try this and see what happens. But because I've room with Dr. J and Dr. J was MJ before MJ, and he really couldn't go anywhere on campus. He was like a celebrity and I used to being able to relate to him and just talking to him about unlock and say, yeah, you're great. You have this, but there's another level if you're interested. I like that. There's another level if you're interested. <laughs> yes. That was always been my approach is to invite people and say, hey, this is my experience. And I think the street cred of being Dr. J's roommate in college was huge. And then being someone that Phil brought in and they trusted Phil and then being able to deliver being able to give them a way forward out of the crisis is one thing if you're stuck in a danger. But I said, yeah, there's danger here, but there's a lot more opportunity and let's deal with that. And actually, this crisis is an opportunity for your latent abilities to express themselves. That's when I started talking about the masterpiece within and this whole idea of unlocking. They realized that you have a masterpiece, you're wired for success. You have this ability to meet any challenge that comes before you and here's a process that can allow you to do that. But I really didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I was wanted to serve and I wanted to offer what I had. That's what I could offer them, how I overcame substance abuse and chronic pain. 
those lessons could be applied to anything, especially to life, because in life, you're going to have suffering. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to meet difficulties. Here's a process that not only allows you to meet difficulties, but to thrive as a result of it. Guys like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, they're at the highest levels. Even beyond teachers and whatnot, they are going to have had experiences of being in the flow state, so to speak. Okay, on the academic side, the academics, many of the mindful practitioners, I can think of academics, he passed along recently, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, very well known for the flow state work. But speak to the connection, because you have the academic side over here, then you have the players on the other side that at the highest level, they're experiencing that flow state. They're experiencing that joy, love state on the court. Were you able to bridge that to get them to see like, hey, you've learned this kind of intuitively, but we figured it out over here on the academic side and helping them to even have more confidence in that? One of the things that I do well, I believe, is that I'm able to work with the whole person. So you can talk about the mental or the physical, but then there's the spiritual and the emotional. So when I talked about the threefold training before, it used to be physical, mental, and spiritual, but I added the emotional component as a fourth component. It's a way of being. So the idea is your work, love, and play, as Freud would say when they asked Sigmund Freud, what was psychoanalysis about? And he said, psychoanalysis is a process that allows you to work, love, and play at your highest capacity. That's what I was offering, this idea of don't make a different distinction between your work life and your love life or work, love, and play, that they're all connected, that there's a way of relating to experience of being yourself no matter where you are, no matter what you are doing. So even though the context was basketball, it's really about life. It's really a philosophy. It's really a way of being that I was offering so that if people chose to apply it to their academics or whatever they were doing, and that you had to have a basketball IQ, it wasn't enough to be athletic, but you got to know how to use your athleticism. And more specifically, you got to know who you are and know how to play to your strengths, to leverage your strengths, and not try to be somebody else, but to be who you are. You have certain gifts, and how do you offer that to the world and to the team? I mean, obviously, I wasn't talking in those terms, but my job was just to get them to be in the moment. And if they manage the moment, everything else is going to be fine. But you got to train for that. You can't just be in a moment and then say, okay, I got to do this. You have to anticipate and say, okay, based on my mistakes or where I wasn't able to achieve or I don't feel satisfied, how do we analyze that? How do we reflect on that? That's going to determine what we need to learn and practice. You do something and you fall down. Okay, so what do we need to change so that you're able to keep your balance and to execute? That is really that simple. My is it's, it's common sense. This whole process is like, okay, who are you and how can you be yourself? How can you express yourself? How can you share yourself? It's an inside job. You got to start with you. So the me is important, but the we is important as well. So that's what we're talking about. And I'm making this up as I go along because it's like, okay, if I know what I'm going to do before I get there, then now I'm imposing my view of things instead of letting things as they are speak to me and then having the solution come out of real time, what's going on and, and what's the appropriate. You are adapting. You are adapting to the situation. Yes. It's a process. Okay, you have a goal. What's the process that's going to allow you to achieve that goal? And that process has to be something that's predicated on some ideas and principles. But then when, as you experience reality, it's going to dictate how you need to make adjustments and change. Like they say, you can't step in the same river twice. You have to have a process that allows us to have self-awareness so that we can self-regulate, so we can have self-control or self-mastery. That's my thing. Resilience, control, commitment, challenge. That's what I learned from recovery and dealing with chronic pain. I had to make the commitment, but I could see things as a challenge, and I have control over whether I react or respond to things. And even when I react to things where there's no space between stimulus and response, I can learn how to create space and in that space, do the things that get me to achieve what I say I want to achieve, to be who I say I want to be. So that's the process. It's my mindfulness and my wisdom, my understanding from moment to moment when I'm engaging with them or helping someone, how to help them create that space and be who they're supposed to be. But they have to know who they are. They have to know 
their strengths and weaknesses. It's just no way around it. So you got to do that individually and collectively, not either or, it's yes and. And at the same time, it's like, okay, so you just got to figure out how to make it work. And Phil had a system, you know, that whole philosophy of basketball, the five fingers as one, buy into that and then figure out how to manage the moment. So in the moment, you can make the changes on the fly that you need to make to stay in the process that's going to get you to where you want to go. Let me shift it into something a little bit fun and interesting because you've been in the catbird seat. There's very few people on this planet that can answer the question that I'm going to ask you. I'm going to name three particular players, all-timers, top 10 players, I would assume. Of course, for sure, top 10. Michael, Kobe, Shaq. Is there a lesson Is there an insight that you learned from each of them? What did each of them teach you in particular? Well, I think at MJ, I'm pretty sure that's where I got my name of my LLC, the Eye of the Hurricane. When I met MJ, it wasn't just watching him play before I even started working with him and realized that as there's more chaos, he got calmer. He was the Eye in the Hurricane. He had this way of being in flow. I can tell you the first time I met him, because even though I started working with the team, he was there. He was in the locker room. He wasn't officially with the team. So I got to say hi to him and get a feel for him. And he just has a presence. You can see he's fully in the moment. He has this tremendous ability to focus and to be in the moment. What I learned from him, his ability to take adversity or his ability to be in the eye of the storm and to relate to things as challenges. There's a lot more that I learned from him, but the main thing was he embodied what I was teaching and to be able to work with somebody like that and then say to them, okay, yeah, that's great. And this is, and I can explain to him, this is why you can do this and how you can do that to some degree where there's a process, but people know about flow. They know about being in the moment. Everything that I teach, I'm teaching myself. In other words, I teach from my own experience. I don't teach from somebody else. He was intuitive and you were reinforcing in many ways. Yes. What I would say is we just connected and I can tell you the first session I had with them when they were in Boston and he came here, he had come back. And I, at that point, they used to come here and I used to work with the team before a game. The typical morning would be I would eat lunch with the coaches and we'd talk about what was going on in Boston. Very rarely could you, in those days, get access to the garden. So we tended to do a pregame stuff in the hotel. So that morning, they would go through the scout. The coaches would get up there and do the scout for the team. And then the coaches would leave and I'd be with the players. And then I'd take them through some movement and some stillness practice. So I might take them through some Qigong or some stretches and sitting, what would I call awareness and breathing, sitting in silence. So he was there. And I remember when we all sat down and we closed our eyes, he looked around to see what everybody else was doing and he just closed his eyes. And that was that. He trusted the situation. He trusted you and just went with it. And he also knew on some level, and I'm sure we probably had a conversation about this. This was helping them to get to where he was or to be able to relate to him more because when he first came back, they were so busy watching him. They weren't playing with him. They were like observers. You can see the fascinating way he plays, but then you got to be engaged in it and you have to raise your level to meet him and to help get to that level where you're able to interact. He knew that you were helping the rest of the team to get to his level. That was his buy-in in many ways. Yes, and it's intuitive. You could just tell. But this is the thing about having this ability to be a silent observer. You just watch things and you notice things and you have access to this tremendous knowing. And you probably had this experience when you can be still and knowing when you're just observing things uncritically or mindfully where you're just letting things speak to you in its own language. When you do that, there's an ability to access this wisdom inside of us that just knows and just say, okay, that's okay. Or you just wait until, okay, it's like you're in the water and you see the stream going a certain way. You are just, instead of trying to do something, you see where the water's going and you see how it's taking you and then you just go with it. And then when you get close to the shore where you want to go, you just ease over and then you just get out. But if you're in a hurry and if you have preconceived notions, and if you're not in the moment, you're in what you think is versus what is, then you miss the flow, you miss the rhythm, you miss the opportunity to just blend and be like water. 
there's something about being able to slow down enough to see things and let things speak to you in their own way, where you're living in the wonder. Wisdom begins in wonder. Out of that silence, there's a knowing. I can talk to you about it a little bit, but I can't really because it's not linear. It's not something you can claim, but you get it. It's like when you're in flow, you're not there. Things are happening, but you're just letting things happen in a way where you got the rhythm, you got the flow, you found the flow, and you just go with it. This is beyond sports. Even though we're talking about an athletic thing, this is a daily occurrence. And this guy, Mihai Chick sent Mihai. He had what he called the example sampling method in his book, Finding Flow in De- Everyday Life. People in all walks of life, they have pages. This is how old this is. It's going back a ways in the 80s, I believe, whenever it was. They would get a page, and when they got the page, they had to stop and write and record what they were doing, how they were feeling, what they noticed, and that sort of thing. So through the example sampling method, he started to understand that people get in flow when their challenges are high and their skills are high, that there's a feedback loop, and there's a whole process that happens when you're in flow. But if you're not out of your comfort zone, you're probably not going to get in the flow. He was able to do this in everyday life, not just athletics that we have flow experiences. We can get in the flow anytime if the conditions are right. And these are the conditions. And the challenging thing is if you try to get in the flow, you won't be able to get in the flow. But if you know the conditions and you allow things to happen and you keep improving your skills, knowledge, and experience and keep challenging yourself that you're out of your comfort zone or a little bit uncomfortable, that's how you get into it. So you have to be challenged. It's like a step function because once you get in the flow, you're at that level, you're there for a while, but then you got to increase your challenges if you want to keep it going. This is how the brain cells work is that it'll fire. But once it gets groove, it stops firing. I can see why guys like you in terms of listening. I'm realizing right now, I'm like, I could have a conversation with George and I could probably lose five to six hours and it would feel like an hour. I mean, just I know I could lose it with you. Let me shift it to Kobe. What did you learn from Kobe? You've been talking about the many things. The audience can realize what you were bringing to the, you know, the next iteration of Phil Jackson's teams, Kobe, Shaq, et cetera. But what did you learn from Kobe? I learned a lot from Kobe as well as all of them. But the real thing is what I had to learn and what I learned from Michael is just understanding who he was and helping him and then asking him what he wants and then going from there. But Kobe was just the mama mentality. I don't have to say any more than that. Jordan was mama mentality before mama mentality then. And it turns out Kobe said it himself, so I don't have to speak for him. He was being mentored by MJ. So you think about what did him and MJ have in common besides tremendous talent? Phil Jackson, Tex Runners, George Mumford, and a process. Same with Shaq. The process is always the same. What I would work at his team was intuition. Like a lot of times I'm just watching and observing, and I never know when I'm going to be called to go up and talk to the team or when I need to communicate with them. So what I learned from Kobe is when I first met him, he was young. I met him in his formative years. It was like he was trying to score 35 points in one shot. My coaching to him was really about the best way to score is not to try to score. How to slow him down and realize that the best way to get what you want is not to try to get there, but just allow it to happen. I learned a lot from him, but the main thing was just, first thing I learned was he's the closest thing to MJ I've seen in terms of that killer instinct. They were very similar, just physically, too. Similar height, similar body shapes. Yes. And what happened was I got to a place where I finally said, well, Kobe's his own thing. Well, I used to compare him to MJ. He's the closest thing to MJ. I've seen MJ as a killer instinct. Kobe's closest to him. And then Kobe was his own man. And then that came about when he heard, I talk about it in my book, The Unlocked, Find the Flow, Embrace Your Greatness, Find the Flow, Discover Success. His index finger was so injured that he couldn't hold a basketball. He didn't take one day off. He just changed everything. He adapted to the new situation. And he put in after work. That's tremendously hard to do what he did. Once he was able to do that, I said, man, he's his own thing. I ain't seen anybody do that. MJ's MJ, Kobe's Kobe. There's a lot of similarities. And this is the thing about Kobe. Kobe would call you and contact you no matter, could be any time of day or whatever. When he wanted something, he would go for it. George, I remember a certain period of time with the Lakers and Shaq, and I remember watching and I remember thinking, are they going to have to change the rules? 
this guy cannot be stopped. I'm speaking of Shaq. I mean, there was a point in time, physically, his basketball skills, etc., literally the biggest athlete, the greatest athlete, his size is crazy, but just the things that he was doing, he was unstoppable for a period of time. Shaq is another one of my guys, man. I love Shaq, and I learned a lot from Shaq. Shaq is very generous, and he's driven. He put in the work, and it's hard to put in the words. Shaq has written kids' books and does stuff like that. But I mean, as far as a force, and I just think everything came together for him. He was perfect for Phil's system and for having a coach like Phil. I can't speak to how dominant he was. He was another one. He was very coachable, very approachable. I enjoyed working with him. I've enjoyed his second life now as a commentator. I enjoy hearing his comments. Even if I'm not following basketball religiously, it will enjoy if I see a clip from Shaq, if he's talking about life or society or whatever, I enjoy his perspectives. I've been fortunate and I've been lucky. And they say that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I learned a lot from them, but the main thing I learned from all of them is to really meet them where they are once they decide where they want to go and then work with them to create a process to get them there. Here you have this experience with Phil Jackson, the two teams in particular, all the success, Hall of Fame players. Now we move forward years into the NBA. Guys are getting paid. Anybody can do this online. You can go look at what your favorite superstars made in the 80s and 90s, add up their lifetime salaries. And some of these young kids today that have done nothing, frankly, except just be potential are being paid more than some of these Hall of Famers we all know. I mean, of course, Michael, Shaq, Kobe all get paid big money. But these young guys are getting paid a lot. In particular, I can think of a guy that was with the Sixers, now with the Nets, this guy, Ben Simmons. He looks like a guy that could use you big time. But I'm curious about your perspective. When money enters, does a guy like George have the potential to affect change? Because there's a lot of guys in the NBA that are never going to be like the winners we've been talking about and the teams that we're talking about. They're just going to be in the NBA, make hundreds of millions of dollars, and frankly, maybe even not be known that well. Speak to the future you see when money is there and if there's not the Phil Jackson, there's not the buy-in. You see where I'm going? Now we're talking about character. One of the things that if you talk about the old school guys, Dr. J and Kobe's like an old school, they would do it even if they weren't paid for it. They love the game and they committed to the game. And it's never about the money and the research. Back in my days when I was a financial analyst, I know that people realize that money only motivates you to a certain level. What's going to motivate you more is your commitment to excellence. So when people ask me what game am I playing, I'm pursuing excellence and wisdom with grace and ease. It's not about the money. It's about the journey. It's about the commitment to being the best, pursuing excellence and wisdom. Unless you have a spiritual foundation or you have a foundation of your values, your integrity, who you are as a person, that can help with that and realize the money is one thing, but who you are, your character, your integrity is a whole other thing. You have to understand. That's why I say the whole person. The money, good food, clothing, and they can help you physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, not so much. It's your relationship to it and how you use it and whether or not you're motivated by self-centeredness or you're motivated for the greatest good or you're doing it because you want to help people beyond yourself. And I'm not judging. I'm just saying there's a certain psychology, a certain energy between for the greatest good, wanting to do things. I mean, I look at LeBron, I look at all of them, but LeBron has done tremendous. He's very good at how he uses money, how he's helped people. And I'm sure all of them have, but the media doesn't talk about their foundations, but they all have that ability. Let me put it this way in psychology terms. There's the internal locus of control, and then there's the external locus of control. When I talk about external locus of control, that means money, prestige, status drives you. When I'm talking about internal locus of control, now I'm talking about inner driven, your values, what it is you want to do, having an understanding of why you are here and who you are. That's very different. I like to say, maybe this is a good segue into this. If you don't know who you are, you could end up being anybody. And if you don't know where you're going, you could end up going anywhere. 
why not decide who you're going to be and where you want to go? And then whether it's money or anything else, you stay in your flow. Did other NBA teams, after hearing about your success over the years, did they bring in mindfulness experts? Yes, to answer your question, it's grown a lot, but you got to understand that when I first started doing this in 1993, that was a little while ago. Let me frame this for a second. I'm imagining Phil Jackson, from what I've read, has a unique perspective, probably more unique than most basketball coaches typically. Just the fact that you ended up there, very unique situation. And in 1993, I would think some players might have been thinking, just for a moment, before they understood Phil and understood you, they might have been thinking, oh my gosh, hippy dippy yoga stuff? What are they doing to us? Maybe they were thinking that. Yeah, well, 20 years previous to that, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> when I was at UMass, when I needed it, people said, you should meditate or do yoga, do this. I said, I'm not going to meditate. Maybe you should rotate, give me a blue and get out of my face. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, I'm being real with it. So I love the skepticism and you're right. But this is the thing when you're committed to learning and pursuing excellence and wisdom, especially excellence and wisdom, you are willing to be open to try new things because you're looking for an edge. Think Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Dr. J, all those cats, they weren't stationary. Each year they were bringing something back to their game. I mean, when I talk about Kobe, after he won, I think it was 2009, one of those championships. After he won the championship, three weeks later, he was down in Houston working with Elijah Wine on his post game. That's what I'm talking about, making 1,300 threes. MJ, all those cats do that. After MJ got the ball stolen from him in 95, came back in 96, and we won 72 games. There's a mindset. There's a way of saying, okay, let's look at mistakes or things that don't work well and use those as stepping stones to getting what we want. And that's how you access the masterpiece within. It's how you unlock by saying yes to whatever comes up, generating the hope, being a learner, understanding that this life, the most amazing adventure you can be on is to get to know yourself better. I have to remind people too, it's like, okay, we've got some great examples in your career, your life at the highest levels of a particular sport and whatnot. But the mindset, the thinking, the perspectives that you have, this is for everyone and anyone. Anyone that's thinking, oh, you know, I'm not at this level or that level. I say nonsense, nonsense. Because look, I'm not Kobe or Michael in terms of some kind of crazy skill like that. But for my world, what I do, I know what you're talking about is terribly important. I understand it even at my level. So I think everyone needs to wrap their arms around that. That it's like, yes, these are some fun, fantastic examples because they really illustrate your points. But this is for everyone. It is. And the reason I wrote Unlocked, like the Mindful Athlete Secret to Pure Performance, that's like foundational. You know, we talk about the five superpowers are, but it's the same drill. It's really about know yourself so you can be yourself. It's like for me, I had to know who I was and be myself. And once I could be myself, I can express myself. And if I can express myself, then I can share myself. So my job is the inside job is a why am I here or who do I want to be and where do I want to go? Not like I can be MJ or Kobe, but no, I got to be George. It's got to be an internal locus of control. It has to be authentically myself. How am I going to be expressed in this situation? The mindful athlete is a process that gets us into pure performance and unlocked, embrace your greatness, find the flow, discover success is about starting from the jump. I have a masterpiece. I have a divine spark. I am wired for success. My job is to unlock. Is to how do I unlock that? And how do I unlock it? When I'm unlocked, what does that look like? Well, that means I've embraced my success within, and it means that I've found my flow, my flow, not somebody else's, and that's how I discover success. I don't care who you are, what you're doing. You have a masterpiece. You have a divine spark. You have Buddha nature, Christ consciousness. Call it what you will, just like the caterpillar that goes into the chrysalis and then it gets metamorphosized and comes out as a butterfly with the strength to fly. That's a metaphor for us that we can stay a caterpillar or we can go in, break out of that encrusted shell where our divine spark is or our masterpiece is and chipping away from the inside out. And the chipping away the struggle is what's going to give us the strength to fly. That's why I wrote this book. I want everybody to realize they have greatness within them. It can be developed. 
but only they can develop it. And to the degree that they develop it and share it and express it, that's going to reflect the quality of life they have. If you want to live more fully and creatively, then you have to unlock. I love the phrase divine spark. And when you say masterpiece, like I'm just sitting here listening. It's like, hey, first time meeting you. We're just talking on the phone. I'm 8,000 miles away from you. And I hear this man talk about divine spark and masterpiece. There's a part of me that's kind of like, damn it, I got to raise my game today. Those are great expressions. I mean, anyone that's got a pulse and you hear some teacher say to you, hey, you need to work on your masterpiece. Hey, you need to be thinking about your divine spark. You hear that. If you don't immediately start feeling something rushing in your blood stronger than the moment before, I don't know. Maybe some people just need to, I don't know, work at 7-Eleven and they don't want to be thinking about their divine spark. I don't know. I love how you say that. Yes, but here's the challenge. The challenge is to the degree that we have freedom and potential, that's one side of the coin. That's heads. Tails is uncertainty and anxiety that comes with it. So why don't people do that? Well, because there's fear, doubt, and insecurity, but it's what Kierkegaard, the existential philosopher, back in 1846, he said this. He said that one side of the coin is potential freedom, the other side is uncertainty and anxiety. And he called it the alarming possibility of being able. That's what we're challenged with. You need a masterpiece to get through that one. You need to access that power within. The alarming possibility of being able. That's a great one, too. When we realize that, and this is the thing, we don't talk about that as much. We say, oh, yeah, you can do this. It's going to be great. But I can tell you, it took me 20 years to write The Mindful Athlete. It was going through the struggle. I say no struggle, no swag. The struggle is what lets your latent abilities express themselves. This is what Hans Selye, the author of the book, The Stress of Life, he says that. That is the adversity that brings the best out of us. And we're willing to say yes to it, embrace it, generate the hope and express ourselves in that context for the greatest good. George, you have an interesting life. Very cool stuff. The book, Unlocked, Embrace Your Greatness, Find the Flow, Discover Success. Recommend everybody check that out. I've only touched on some of the areas and many of the areas that you go in, so I highly recommend people to check that out. Hey, George, is there a website you want to direct people to where they can come find more about you? The website is georgemumford.com. You can definitely go there. And also, I mean, there'll be more about it. I believe you can go on to Amazon and pre-order the book. When I have a YouTube channel, I have things and go to website and there's all kinds of offerings and people can access what I do. And even if you Google my name, there'll be so much stuff that comes up around that. But it's really, I appreciate this opportunity because I want everybody to have that experience. Everybody's a Michael or Kobe or Shaq, not in being them, but what we have in common is them being themselves, being authentically who they are, being sincere with what they're doing and doing it for the greater good, doing it in the context of team and realizing that, yeah, that's how I look at it. It's an amazing opportunity for all of us. That's why I'm here. I want everybody to have that excitement. And a lot of my work has been done with female athletes and kids and others, parents, CEOs, whatever. It really doesn't matter. What we have in common is we have the potential we have that great potential within us that's unlimited, that can be developed. And this is what my job is to help people access it and develop it and then encourage them to share it. Sir, you are an inspiration. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me on here. And this is the official book launch. So I realized that today. And I can't tell you how excited I am about it and enthusiastic about it. And it's interesting, Michael, because here's what my experience has been. I've gone through all kinds of adversities, continue to go through them, but it only makes me stronger. And the interesting thing is, almost 40 years later, and I have more enthusiasm and excitement about life than I've ever had, I'm not middle-aged because I don't suspect I'm going to live to be 100. Hold on. How many years young are you? 71. Going on 72 in November. I like to feel like when I'm talking to somebody that they have the same enthusiasm that I do or more. You're one of those people. What is it about the tone of someone's voice or just that, like, I don't think I could turn you off. If I didn't tell you, hey, George, you got to <laughs> stop talking, maybe you would keep talking to me. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we just keep going forever. Let's talk about the word entheos, where's enthusiasm. Entheos, that's the spirit within. It's the God within. I'm just letting the spirit move through me, brother. That's what it is. We all have that access and that power, that access 
is beyond aging and beyond time. Great stuff, George. I appreciate it. Please keep me posted on future books. I'd love to have you on again in the future. My intention is to reach as many people as I can because that's the great secret is you're wired for success. You have everything you need to succeed. The real question is, do you have the will? Are you willing to experience the alarming possibility of being able? Great stuff. George, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Michael. appreciate you, man. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.